In this video I'll demonstrate the three ways I know to make trays. In the next video I'll show how to cover them. I think learning how to make a tray is one of the first steps in learning how to make boxes. For box-like objects with right angled corners, the tray is the building block of these objects. A box with a lid is just two trays. A fancier version is three trays with the bottom being a tray inside a tray. A slipcase is a three-walled tray with a permanently attached lid. A clamshell enclosure is two trays attached to a case or wraparound cover. A simple tray can be used to collect your change or to cover a sheet of gold leaf. The two common variations that you'll find in binderies around the world are building the tray with the walls butting up against the base or the walls on top of the base. The third method, which is the first method, but with what is often called a flange on the outer board, was taught to me by my first bookbinding teacher, and I think it's the best method. In the first method, when you look at the base from the outside, you can see the edge of the walls going around the base. With the second, with the walls on top of the base, looking at the base from the outside, you only see the base, but from the side, you can see the edge of the baseboard. If you're making a lid, this second approach may be better as there's no chance of the joins showing through the covering material on the top. I think walls on top of the base is harder to make than butting up against. The third method is less common, yet I think it's by far the best and it's what I use all the time. Like the first method, the walls butt up against the base, but the base is laminated to some thin card which extends past the edges of the board. Once the walls are built, the thin card is trimmed flush to the edges. Some people will say the extra step makes this method slower. I think that the small amount of time it takes to laminate the base to a piece of card is quickly made up for by making everything else easier and faster. In bookbinding, there's always variations. If you're making something large, you might want to make it very strong, and this is usually done with double walls. I very seldom need to do this, but it's useful to know it's an option, and I'll do a separate video on double wall boxes. Some people will say my third method is an example of double walls. Maybe this is technically right, but I think it's more like reinforcing the joints, like it used to be common to do with strips of paper. For me, double walls usually refers to the walls, not the base. But if you want to call the third method a double wall base, then I'm not going to correct you. Much less common today, but the standard way of making trays and boxes in trade binderies of the past was to score or partially cut the board and then to fold it. Often the only thing holding the corners together was the covering material, which was often just paper. This was fast and cheap, and many types of boxes were made this way. Everything from boxes for books, slipcases, boxes for any manner of objects, even game boxes. This weakness of only being held together with the covering material is why you find so many boxes with burst open corners. If strength was required, the joints might, might be reinforced with a strip of paper before covering. You can often see these strips under the covering material once you start looking for it. The basic steps in making a tray are determining the size, usually by measuring the object that will go into it, deciding what materials to use, cutting the materials, sometimes the board will be lined before cutting and gluing together, sometimes a bit of sandpaper is used to clean up rough edges and joints before covering. I'll describe different approaches to covering in another video. In the first and third methods, the board is cut to the size of the object plus some allowance for tolerance and covering materials. In the second method, the size of the base is increased by two thicknesses of the wall board in each direction since the walls sit on the base. I usually add one millimetre for covering material and the additional tolerance depends on what the box or tray is for. For slip cases, I add one millimetre for height and width, which usually results in a snug fit. For looser fits, I might add two or three millimetres. I use my usual board cutting method using an Ulfa knife, steel rule and bench hook. 
In the video, my bench has a huge bench hook on it. I could have just screwed the back piece of wood to the bench. I start by cutting the base to size and then the walls to height. It is best to have the grain direction for both the base and walls go long grain. I'll do a short video on this subject so as to not make this video too long. I cut the walls to length not by measuring them with a ruler but by taking the measurements from the base and adding or subtracting two thicknesses of board as required for the walls. The walls are made in pairs. I'll cut the first wall from the base and then use the first wall to cut the second to length. If the box is deep and it's going to be difficult to line the inside after making, it's easier to line the board before making the deep tray. This is really the only option for slip cases. If you're going to line board with paper, the usual and sensible approach is to paste or glue out the paper, let it relax and apply it to the board. It will then pull and warp the board. To flatten the board again, the other side will need lining too. Once the board is again flat, the pieces can be cut out. Or you can cut out the pieces and glue out the board pieces with a dry adhesive such as PVA and apply to the paper. This goes against the rule of gluing out the thinner material and risks wrinkles forming. But if you use a dry adhesive and the pieces are not large and you nip them straight away, I normally get lucky and not only do wrinkles not form, the board doesn't warp. And this is what I normally do. Now we have all the pieces, we can start sticking everything together. I'll start with the easier approach of walls against the base. This tray will try and stick itself to the bench, so I normally make it on a sheet of mylar or some other rigid plastic. I start by putting a thin layer of adhesive around the edge of the base. The first two edges I attach are the ones that match the dimensions of the base. I put glue on their ends and along the edge that will butt up against the base. Applying glue to the edges of board is easier done with the side of the brush. Less glue will get on the face of the boards this way. And to get a small bead of glue along the edge of the board, drag the brush over the edge. Getting just the right amount of glue on the brush is the key. Once the first two walls are done, the other two are applied. Instead of glue on their ends, they get a bead on the end edge, like the base. Once all the board is in place, you have a minute to make small adjustments. If anything won't stay in place, a piece of masking tape usually holds it until the adhesive tacks. Of course, the iBookbinding corner magnet clamps work a wonder. Making the trays with the walls on top I find the hardest. Again I start with the two walls with a matching dimension to the base. Then the two walls that fit inside the first two. Everything feels a little less stable doing it this way. But once the glue dries it's very strong. I start with a bead of adhesive around the base on the top edge. For the walls each surface that will contact another gets a coating of adhesive. The adhesive needs to be fast tacking but with enough open time and slip to let you position each piece. Something that starts to tack in 10 to 15 seconds and has bonded fairly well in a minute is ideal. Most of the PVAs aimed at the bookbinding market are perfect. The same as bookbinding, just look for a PVA designed to be used with paper. I like to work fast when making boxes and a slightly thicker PVA works well. You'll notice that a jar of PVA gets thicker with time. This is simply due to evaporation of water. You could keep an older jar of PVA aside just for box making. 
If your PVA ever gets too thick, just stir in some water to get it back to the thickness you want. To position the walls flush with the edge of the base, it's good to have something to butt up against the base that the walls can be pushed up against. It's going to get glue on it, so it has to be able to be wiped with a wet rag. I'm simply using a piece of board covered in Arbolave buckram, which has a waterproof coating. The third and my preferred method is to first laminate card to the base. Again, I break the rule and apply the adhesive to the thicker material. With board, there's very little chance of wrinkles forming. The grain direction of the card should match the board grain direction. The card has to be bigger than the base by enough to make trimming easy later. I normally cut this by eye. Building the walls is like the first method, except there's another surface that needs adhesive, the bottom edge of the walls. Once everything is dried, it's very easy to trim the card flush to the edges of the tray with a thin knife or scalpel. If you want a really strong tray, you could also do this to the two sides that show the ends of the other walls.
I hope you've enjoyed today's video and that you make a few trays this week so you're ready to cover them next week. As always, I really appreciate you hitting the big thumbs up button. If you're able and want to, you can support the making of more videos like this through Patreon or with a one-off contribution and the details are in the description below. If you want to be notified of my future videos, please hit the subscribe button. Until next time, cheerio.